Hello, friends, and welcome to what is my favorite part of the week, and I hope it's your favorite too. It is 60 minutes of unscripted.net entertainment. Our mission is to empower the .NET community, that's you, to achieve more. I'm your host, Cam Soper, with co-hosts David Pine and Myra Wenzel. And I would like to welcome today's guest, Microsoft Community MVP, James Hickey. James, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, what you're about? Sure. Thanks, Ken. Uh, so about myself, um, I am in Eastern Canada in Nova Scotia, to be specific. Um, I'm about 10 minutes from the Bay of Fundy, which most people, most people probably don't know where that is. But basically, uh, it's a bay, and there's the uh, highest tides in the world. Uh, in this bay. So you think of like uh, eastern coast of the United States and you kind of keep going up on the east coast until you hit Canada and then there's kind of like a little uh, inlet kind of thing. Anyways, um, I've been working remote for about five years so I'm fortunate to be able to to live out here which would be rural compared to where a lot of people live I think. Um, a lot of farms and stuff around here. Thankfully, there's fiber op cable that runs through here, so um, it's good. Good, good news for me. You're better off than me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's incredible. Now, I have I have fiber, but I live in Kansas City, so Kansas City was like the first city that Google Fiber built out. Okay. Um, now I was like one of the last people to get it because they didn't do my neighborhood. It was under construction when they started construction, so they're just like, oh, let's skip it, and we'll come back to it in eight years. Um, yep. but that's, that's incredible because I grew up like in rural Missouri. Now for folks who aren't familiar <laughs> with United States geography, if you point to the, like the, 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 con to the center of the continental U S Missouri is pretty much right in the middle. Right. And I, I grew up in, 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 in the sticks and, uh, yeah, <laughs> my, I have, I have a friend who just recently moved away from there and the best he was able to do before Starlink was his mobile phone and even then wow. yeah so uh yeah that's incredible that they have fiber optic in rural canada that's yeah that's canada. amazing I i'm this close to starting my own uh internet service provider company <laughs> just so i can have fiber here because it's ridiculous i don't I'm think i have fiber where i'm at and i'm near los angeles so it's like <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm yeah near uh, milwaukee wisconsin so it's like come on like seriously yeah. Anyways, I think the big reason is there's uh, basically the community provincial community college. Um, okay. And they train a lot of like surveyor, like uh, doing a lot of geography kind of stuff, um, like map building and I guess for building houses and stuff too. They, they do a lot of training for that. And there was an IT program there, which which I took. Um, I think it's still there. Anyways, I think that's the only reason there's there's like one five up up uh, line going through. Anyways, very 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 good for me. Um, yeah. So uh, as far as you know, MVP stuff. Um, probably the biggest thing is what we're going to talk about today: open source project uh, Corvel. Uh, I guess we can get into that in a bit. Um, I do a lot of writing. I wrote a book about TypeScript a few years ago. Yeah. Love TypeScript. Um, yeah, what else? I, I write a lot for, I've written a lot of stuff uh, for Okta, Event Store, uh, Venmo. Yeah, just lots of different companies that, that I've done a lot of writing for. It's one of those things when you're like, yeah, when you create content, you have strengths and weaknesses. Like, uh, you know, some people are really good at recording videos and doing like video courses. And um, some people maybe are good at doing a lot of speaking. Um, I've I've gravitated towards writing for just for whatever reason. It's one of those things I enjoy doing and I find I'm better at it than the other things. Um, but yeah, I, I have spoken uh, at uh, some user groups about Clean architecture, uh, what what's good, what's bad, those kinds of things. Um, event sourcing, 
um, with TypeScript. There was a thing I did on that a while back. Uh, did talked about domain-driven design, those kinds of things. And those are all things I'm interested in, a lot of architecture uh, kinds of things. We welcome all of those subjects on the show as well. So if Absolutely. you or someone else wants to come, like clean architecture is always uh, one of top videos on the on the channel as well. So yeah, definitely something people are interested in. Yeah, it's um, a big topic, definitely. So your project that you're here to talk to us today about Corvell, what? What is Corvell? Give us shouldn't the we, give us the elevator. We transition pitch. For, can, don't we have to transition? Come on. We no, can't we just, don't have to transition. We, we, we did away changed. with the transition. We changed. <laughs> we, we, we are experimenting with a new format this year. We are uh, not this year, this week. We are all hallway <laughs> track now. We are doing away with the transition. But we don't we've got we've got bumpers though, right? No, yeah. I mean, no. I, we can play the hallway track bumper, but it's just gonna waste six seconds. Why don't we just hop into the content? Okay, okay. That's, I just thought it was a little jarring to just <laughs> well, well, we'll 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 work okay. on this. As 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 with all things, I think we should play it just because David wants. <laughs> there you go. Oh God! Now it's awkward. Now it's that thing where it's like, okay, no, <laughs> they ask for it. It's good. It's all this good. is the hallway track. Woohoo! This is the segment where we highlight our you know community members. Um, and James is going to share this amazing open source project. And uh, yeah, so I, I just want to start right away with saying naming things is hard. How'd you come up with the name? <laughs> okay, so the name, I don't know if I should tell the story first. Well, I'll tell you the name. So, <laughs> well, no, I'll, I'll explain the story. So the backstory to Coravel, which I think is interesting, and, and I think it, probably can you know connects with a lot of developers uh when i when i started like my first job as a software developer uh was doing which most people probably even know what asp web forms are now but basically is <laughs> doing asp web forms which was like the old dot net te technology mm -hmm. um you know there's pros and cons to every technology uh and how you use technology to uh, matters. So anyways, uh, how how things were structured and architected in, in that system, I would say was very poor. And I spent probably, you know, the first year, year and a half learning how to do things in, in just the way that that company decided to, to do things. Uh, very inefficient uh, way of doing things, very prone to bugs and, and hard hard to maintain, hard to understand, like, Oh, I need to build this new feature. Where do I, where do I even put it? Like, I don't even know where where to put this new feature. Where where to you know where do I put new files and things like that? So yeah, probably about a year and a half in a kind of in as a software developer, like just had the realization that this doesn't feel right. Like, there's got to be a better way to build web applications than this. And again, it wasn't wasn't about web forms in particular. It was how this company decided to to uh to build things and so yeah long long story short i discovered laravel which is still to today is i think probably the biggest uh php web framework um yeah so i, I started digging and exploring that at the time just yeah exactly po post back yeah don't if you're not posting back all those kinds of fun things um i'm just responding to the chat message I came up. Um, so yeah, Laravel was uh, an MVC-based kind of uh, framework, which at the time, the .NET MVC framework was kind of up and coming, but I'd say it wasn't fully mature. A lot of, a lot of companies still hadn't uh, jumped on board at that moment in time. So this would have been like 2015-ish, something like that. Um, so yeah, I started digging into Laravel, building just these test projects on my own and, and learning, you know, ironically, learning about architectural things through, uh, through Laravel and how the project is structured. Uh, but I don't, 
personally, I don't like PHP. Uh, I prefer .NET, and there are you know reasons for that. And so, yeah, yeah, let's go after that. Um, <laughs> and so, this was right around the time .NET Core first, not not when it came out. Uh, I'd say .NET Core two version two was probably when it was like really uh, usable. So this was when it was like .NET Core before version two it was like version one, just kind of like beta testing, like the test version of it, I guess you'd call it that. Um, so yeah, it was interesting because it was like very clear that .NET was moving towards a more modern way of doing things uh, across platform, which is a huge, out of everything, I think that's probably the biggest improvement compared with the old .NET framework. Um, and again, this goes back to like PHP versus .NET Framework, which was the old Windows only .NET uh, before the new .NET. Um, you could only run it on Windows machines and typically you'd have to use it with like uh, IIS, which is like the, the Windows web server infrastructure. Um, whereas with PHP, I literally just had files. I'd put them on a server and, <laughs> and it would work, right? So, um, so anyways, yeah, Laravel had, had all these extra features too, like uh, task scheduling, a lot of background scheduling that was easy to use. Basically, you just create a file, uh, inherit a specific interface, and then away you go. It, you know, There's a lot of utilities to, to do that stuff really easily, caching, um, all that kind of stuff. Anyways, so essentially what I wanted to do is, hey, what if I took like all these things that Cor or that Laravel is doing, um, bring that into .NET and like try to play around with that, right? Uh, these, these things that are really easy to do in P PHP or with Laravel that didn't really have a easy to use equivalent in .NET. So Coravel then is the kind of shoving .NET Core, right, Core and Laravel, so it's like core. Ah, uh, okay. Shoving those two uh, things together. So that that's sense. kind of yeah. So that's kind of the uh, I guess philosophy or whatever is behind behind the project is like, hey, I want to build a web app. I want to use .NET, um, and I maybe want to do like task scheduling, which we can get into. Uh, um, let's on here. So there's task scheduling, queuing. So, hey, I have, you know, I'm getting a web, uh, web request in, but I have this really big, chunky piece of work that I need to do. You know, I got to do a lot of database calls to maybe to do this, or you're maybe you're doing like, you're encoding some video or something really that takes a long time. You don't want to do that on your web request because your user's looking at a spinner, right? If, if it takes like 20 seconds to do that piece of work. Uh, you don't want your user sitting there with the spinner for 20 seconds. So typically, the approach you would probably want to take is do all that work on the back on a background thread, or you know, do it in a background job, whatever you want to call it. Um, so Corvel lets you do that um, caching, and then there's event broadcasting. There's another another thing we can get into. Uh, so that's basically the st <laughs> the story, I guess, as far sure. as. Uh, or the name and, and what, why, why it has these features and not others and, and those kinds of things. So now there is now certainly I think like the head the 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 top feature there that shows up for Coravel whenever you look at look at the Coravel you know project or whatever is the task scheduling. Yeah, and we've already definitely. got a question from uh, from one of our viewers here. I want to know. Okay, so there's another task scheduling library out there that that people are pretty familiar with, Hangfire. Um, how does Coravel compare to Hangfire? Yep. So that's funny. I think that was actually the first issue in the project. <laughs> we could go check that out later, but it was definitely like either the like first or second issue uh, in the project. <clears throat> so yeah, there's there's a few differences if. I guess I'll rewind the clock back to when I first built this. Um, at the time, Hangfire was not compatible with .NET Core. Um, it was, but the way that it hooked into .NET Core was kind of funky. Um, it didn't take advantage of the async await 
stuff that you can do in C Sharp, which, which is actually a huge thing, uh, being able to use async await. Yeah, it'd be very limiting without that. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're if if you're trying to do that in a web application, uh, basically you're 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 stealing threads and uh, your web, you know, your web server, so to speak, uh, can't doesn't have as much threads to be able to respond to requests and uh, you know, essentially start getting timeouts and things like that much quicker. Um, big big performance issue there. So uh, yeah, Coravel. And that's it. Like when it, again, like when I built it, it was really like, hey, I want, I want to learn how to use .NET Core. All these new p pieces that were brought into .NET Core, like the built-in uh, dependency injection stuff, um, async await, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, so that was baked into Coravel. Whereas Hang Fire didn't support async await, for ex for example. Uh, another thing is, uh, which today I'm not sure if it does. I know there was an ongoing uh, that the creator of Hangfire was trying to address that. Um, I'm assuming that's probably not the case today. Um, yeah, I've Hangfire... used it with async and await before Hangfire. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and I think with Hangfire also there's you have to there's kind of like a a separate process or server or whatever that you have to run in addition to your your web app. Um, so that was essentially out of process is what you're saying versus is Coravel. Yeah. So we actually have another question that kind of relates to all of this. Um, <laughs> our, our, uh, our good friend and co-host Cecil Phillip is asking, can Corvel do out of process scheduling? Sort of. Um, Love the answer. That's perfect. Yes. So if so, you can. The nice thing about Coravel is because it hooks into the the .NET Core fundamentals, I guess, if you mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, pieces. Um, you you can you can use Coravel in a Windows service, for example. Um, yep. So you could have a Windows service that's you know doing task scheduling in the background. Can it do out of process? For example, hey, I, I'm shoving an item on a queue through my web app, and I've got another process that's processing that. No, Corville can't do that right now. Um, that's probably the big like. Out of there's so many improvements I want to make, and time, life, you know, it's just it's so limited. So this um, is your call to action, right? Yeah, Officially. yeah. So like, if you're watching <laughs> the stream, this is open source, my friends. Right. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so anytime, anytime I spend on this, this time I'm not with my family or, or right. you know, I have a day job and all that kind of stuff. I That's the kids, open source so. life. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's something, yeah, we can talk about that later too, like just open source in general, but yeah, out of process, that's a big one that I I'd, I'd like to do. Um, right, right now everything's in memory, okay. which I kind of like because it, it, just it's easier easy, I guess, communication, perhaps. Like, well, it's like the philosophy of the of the library in the beginning was just what's the easiest way I can do these things without having to install other infrastructure or right all these other things that typically it's like, hey, I need caching. All oh, right, let's use Redis or like right. let's use this other thing. Oh, I want to. Um, you know, I want to do task scheduling. Oh, well, now I got to like go into the Windows task scheduler and mm, right. tink tinker around with that. Um, so would you say so, that Corvel like has an emphasis on simplicity? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's like, I have a web application. I just want to use this library. Like you install a NuGet package and out of the box, it just works. It doesn't matter what other infrastructure you don't have or you do have. Okay. That being said, yes. Um, out of process processing is a big is a big ask. Yeah. Um, and again, it's like Hang Fire does that, so it's like, hey, if you really need that, then this is probably not the thing for you. Okay. Um, so I was never really like, yeah, it's it's been an ongoing thing for a few years now, but it it's there one was of those an things, earlier yeah. question actually too that kind of pulls this all back in. This was very early in the stream. Um, but uh, Nerd Herder was asking about other comparisons to other packages. And I know that we talked about um, Hangfire, but they specifically mention Quartz here. And I've never even heard of that. So I don't know if you've heard of that or not. Or yeah. It relates. 
Yeah, so I think Quartz was a, was actually a port from a Java library. Um, Enough of that. We can move on. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't used Quartz, but again, that was like one of the that. It's funny because it always comes up. Hang fire and quartz. Like oh, that's okay, the okay. Between this hang fire and quartz. Um, so I, yeah, I think the big difference is this does more than just task scheduling. Um, and I think, I mean, you can see this image right here. Like the, yeah. I, I tried to mimic the way Laravel. One of the things that was really nice, still is really nice about Laravel, is you can tell there's a lot of thought that went into their their APIs. Um, that was one of the biggest things I appreciated about Laravel. And so I tried really hard to, to replicate that, not on a, like a verbatim kind of basis, but just, you know, make it super easy, super like readable. Right. So when you read this, it's like, okay, I want to schedule this job and it's going to run daily. Okay. Like that's pretty easy to understand what's going on. Um, of course, there's more advanced things you can do. Um, but yeah, I don't know how courts, if they're, I think their API is probably not as simple, uh, if you want to put it that way. Sure. Um, but we yeah. do have other questions streaming in as well. Let's well, jump we have to this so one. many. Yeah, there's, there's quite <laughs> a good. few coming Great. in. <laughs> um, do you want to take this one, Cam, or do you want me to? Um, well, I was wondering if we should take questions now or if we should, should let James give us a little bit more of the elevator pitch. Oh, I, I, I love interrupting James. It's my favorite. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I was thinking if we want to see it in action first and then we go into the questions. Um, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's, I got this one up here. Let's do this one real quick and then we'll do, uh, what you guys proposed. So, um, how does Corbell work with DI in particular transient lifetime instances? I know you mentioned it goes uh, works with the fundamentals, so I would assume that this is its bread and butter. But I could be wrong, so let's let's talk yep. through that quick. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, you and yeah. So maybe we'll talk about. Uh, let's go to the official docs here. Um, this would be a good segue into. Let's zoom in on this too, if we could. Okay. Do you want me to do that or? Uh, yeah, just, if, you, if, if you could on your on your browser there. Can I? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. There. So with with Coravel, and again, this is this is kind of the way that Laravel did or uh, does this. So the in Coravel and invo Vocables is kind of this like really, really core concept when you're uh, building the code for, for doing different things. Um, yeah, and so invocable represents a self-contained job within your system. Uh, I guess what's interesting about that is you can do lots of different things with it. It's you can schedule it, for example. Um, you can queue it, for example. Um, uh, those those kinds of things. Uh, you can manually because it is just literally a class. Uh, I guess I'll scroll down. Uh, here's an example. I I literally could just you know, inject this into a controller method or through a controller constructor um, and get that class. And then I just call the, uh, this invoke method and it does the work that I need it to do. Um, so it's, it's kind of this uh, decoupled concept, I guess, if you want to put it that way. So it basically just represent, it represents some work that you want to do. And then uh, out of curiosity, just to clarify real quick, oops. In, in that specific situation, would you be injecting uh, the send daily reports email job directly or the I invocable? Uh, if you want to use it, then you probably want to inject the, the concrete Spec class. Concrete yeah. Type. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, and so that this, so this represents, this would be the actual code for that invocable. Um, and here, here's actually the image on the on the README there in GitHub. And this is how you could schedule it if you want to schedule it. Um, very simple way to do that. And again, there's uh, I don't know if there's an example here. Uh, okay, yeah, there's an example of queuing something like that. So this would be this line right here. Uh, this is the Corvel queue IQ. 
And so you just say, okay, I have my queue and I want to queue that invocable. And that's going to shove it to the background and it's going to run it later at some point in a few seconds, probably. Um, and that way your web, your web request is really quick and that work you need to do in the background will, will just you know happen later. Um, and again, you can, it's, yeah, it's this flexible concept, the, the I invocable um, that you can do. All that to come around to the question, <laughs> it, does it hook up with the, uh, yes, it does. Um, and that, again, because it's decoupled, you're, you're in control of that. You can create an evocable, and then you get to decide, do I want to add this as a transient service? Uh, for those who don't know, transient basically means every time you are injecting that class using dependency injection, um, like, I guess, yeah, I don't have an example of it. Well, I guess it would be like this. If it's transient, then every time this, this class is um, invoked, this job happens, um, it's going to create a new instance of that class every time. Uh, but there's other there's other uh, lifetimes that you can choose. One is scoped. In this case, uh, scoped actually would behave the same as transient. Um, and then I think you can do add singleton. So if you do add singleton, basically if your class would be in, uh, instantiated once, it would remain in memory uh, and it would be that same instance of the class that's um, used throughout the basically until your app is killed or, or closed or goes goes down. Uh, and there's different reasons why you might want to do that. Um, but typically, typically, yeah, you, you'd want to do transient probably. Um, but yeah, essentially, long way to answer. Yes, it it works with all the built-in uh, life cycles. You you have control over that. Um, so yeah. Should we keep going with the questions? We've got more, or we can. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I we can keep going with the questions. Um, and if we run out, then I can try to <laughs> talk more. <laughs> uh, tr 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 I'm scrolling back here. So there was one question that it, that it was about: Was it Windows only, or can you use in other kind of apps? So it seems like that was. Like from the description, it seems like that is related to the Windows task scheduler and the Windows services. Yeah, so you can use Coravel anywhere. You can use build a .NET app, essentially. Um, so that would be Windows. It would be Linux. It would be Mac. Um, iOS, I guess if you're using Xamarin, uh, you could use or it. Maui. Maui. Maui now, yeah. Sorry, I apologize. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, yeah, I've, I've not. I can't think of anybody using Coravel in something like Maui, but I, I'm assuming that you could. Worst case, it would work in your back your API layer, I guess, on the server. Um, but yeah, again, you you can you can build a Windows service. You can use this with the Windows service. Uh, or in Linux, it wouldn't be a Windows service. It would be a Unix service, I guess, or, or whatever. Um, I forget the worker service. I think in .NET is the, the proper term for that. Um, so yeah. So apropos of nothing, actually, can we put that question back up real quick? <clears throat> apropos of nothing, literally everything, I've been trying to reply to you with this question for like 10 minutes. And apparently, this is just an FYI, apparently your username breaks the YouTube chat completely because I keep replying to you. And no matter what I type, all that comes up in the YouTube chat is a smiley, is a, is, is a smile emoji. So um, <laughs> just thought you might want to know, your username breaks YouTube chat. <laughs> <laughs> Literally everything. <laughs> uh, there cool. was another one here. If you... Coravel, can Coravel task schedule creates jobs or tasks and add them without restarting the service? So technically, yes. Um, OK, so this is another story. Um, <laughs> so there, basically, there's the open source package, and then there's also what I call Coravel Pro. Um, I guess I'll open that up. 
Corvell Pro is, you have to pay for it. Um, well, I guess technically you can use it and it will work. Um, but I ask that people pay for it, but I, I don't lock people out of it if they don't. Um, essentially, it's a admin administration UI, and you actually I have it running right now. Um, so basically, all your invocables that you create, um, it'll automatically detect them. You don't have to do anything special. It'll list them out here. So like this, this is just an invocable class, um, which highlights how decoupling that concept from everything. You can reuse it in lots of different ways. Um, so I can run that, you know, just it's, this is just like a dummy, a dummy sample. But um, for example, I might want to re-index my database. Okay, I'll come in here and I'll, you know, run this. It'll re-index the database for me in the background. Um, I could schedule that if I want. I can come in here. Okay, uh, this is already scheduled. Every five minutes, I'm going to re-index my database, right? So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, essentially, the code. So the code to be able to do these things, like for example, I can, uh, I can schedule this. Essentially, as it to the scheduler. Um, so the code to do that is available. Um, it's not technically a public API, so to speak. There is an issue on the GitHub project, on Corvel, the open source project. There is a question. There might be actually multiple, this question asked multiple times. Um, there is an issue, so there is definitely an issue. And basically, I pasted the code to be able to do this. Um, so it's technically not officially supported, but it, you can do it. Um, at some point, yeah, it, it, this would be a good thing to actually expose through via a public API, I think. Um, again, it's just one of those things that it's on the list. It's on the to-do list, and there's there's a lot of a lot of things I'd like to do. And um, yeah, so the the answer so, is yes. <laughs> so for someone using the non-pro version, like the free version, so that is not available with that version. Uh, you can do it. So there is code to do that, but it kind of the code to do Has it kind of bugs. Not that there's bugs, but you're starting to dig into some of the internals. It's um, so if you it's really want to, you can. <laughs> it's, it's discouraged, but if you really want to, you can. And there is an issue. I don't know if it's open or closed. It might be probably closed, but there is an issue with the code to be able to to do that. Use at your discretion. Um, but it works. But yes, and it is it is thread safe be, again because I'm I'm already using uh, that that piece in the co in the pro uh, version, and that you know that's a big thing is thread safety. Um, that that's a whole other topic, and yeah, that's I discovered through building this that um, yeah you. A lot of times you think it's easy. Oh, I'm just going to build my own queue and task scheduler, and I'm going to reuse the built-in .NET. You know, there's like a concurrent queue, which is a .NET type. Um, it's so easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's I, really. I love when developers admit this because I do the same thing all the time. <laughs> this can't be that hard, right? And no. you go do it, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and that's. Yeah, that's one of the things that makes adding like new bigger for example persistence right like hey i want to i want to add something to the queue and i want to persist that to a database and then maybe have another process again like out of process for example um it's like getting 99 percent of the way there is easy so to speak but mm -hmm. it's that last one percent where it's like you really have to make sure you're all that concurrency stuff is solid, right? And um, yeah, it takes a lot of time to test that, and again, make to make the code work properly and think about it. And again, again, it's like, are there any of these concepts that I want to extract, like the invocable concept? Uh, is there kind of is there something useful there that I can abstract 
put an abstraction around that makes everything easier. Uh, you know, oh, okay, this this piece I actually want to probably reuse in this other feature. Well, now I have to think about how am I going to decouple that from the feature I'm building now and make it available to a future feature. Um, and those are, you know, those are all the things that come up when people make pull requests. You know, it's like, thank, great, like new feature done. This person added a new feature. Thank you for doing that. But a lot of times it doesn't take into consideration, well, you know, I'm actually planning on doing this other thing and this other thing. Um, so this would actually hinder those other efforts in the future, which, you know, it's no, nobody's fault. Um, so this def, yeah, those, all, all that kind of stuff is, is in play, I guess, when you're maintaining a open source project. Is there another question? Well, there's lots <laughs> more. There's lots okay. more. We can, we, we can keep going here with questions. Uh, okay. let's see here real quick. Uh, so we had one, uh, particularly as asking about like payloads, like could invocables have various, um, class types or custom type arguments? Uh, I, let me reread that. Uh, so with an invocable, you can base, it's kind of like a self-contained class. So you can do whatever you want in there. Um, I think maybe. So like it call, like invoke is the official signature. There's no parameters, right? Yeah. So there's, there is a way to do that. Um, Oh, like a uh, payload right there. Yeah. So just read the docs. We got docs yeah. here. We got, uh, that's, that's perfect. That is yeah. great. So essentially there is a API to say, Hey, here's an invocable. With I want payload. to queue uh, okay. that. And then there's extra parameters to pass in, you know, whatever additional payload essentially. Yeah. And now that, that gets passed in through dependency injection magic. Um, so yeah, that, that is an option to do, um, Again, that would be handy. I can I understand that would be handy to do if if that was being persisted to a database or or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but again, to to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then also we've got another question here about chained scheduling. So like, can you chain various things that might depend on one another? Uh, I don't know. There's no like dependency. Like one uh, scheduled task has to succeed before the next one could run and like it could run in sequence. I think that's what they're kind of getting at. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's not really built in. There's, yeah, okay. there are ways to do it, but it's not built in. Sure. Um, I'll hi I will highlight, where is it here? Okay. I'll highlight this is kind of related, not really, but. Oh yeah. Um, so one, so one of the things that could happen is you, you could schedule this, this in this case, it's some invocable. Let's say this is a job. It does a database call. It does some stuff, and then it writes to your database. Um, usually, it takes like five seconds, um, and you schedule this every minute. So usually, this triggers every minute. Takes five seconds, and you're done. Okay. What happens when, let's say, your database is really slow, or you know, there's connectivity issues, and in in your code, you've you have like a retry mechanism that you've you've built in, um, again, which which is another feature I'd like to bake into Corvell, which isn't there retries, um, and let's say for whatever reason database is slow and it actually takes more than a minute to run. Okay, well while that first one is running, now that there's a second instance that that's triggered, and so you now the same you have the same job running at the same time twice, whereas one is almost done and then the other one comes up. Um, so you can get data consistency issues with that. For example, you get race conditions, all those kinds of, again, fun concurrency kinds of things that come up. Um, so yeah, Corvel gives you this really nice API to say, hey, um, this, and this is basically a, a key that you give it. So you say for this specific job, I want to prevent that to happen. So if this job is still running after a minute, Coravel says, hey, is there another instance of this running already? Oh, okay, there is. So I'm not going to run another instance yet. I'm, I'm just going to defer. And maybe it'll be at minute two. It'll check the second time. Okay, there's no other instance running now. I'll run a fresh instance. Uh, and you can do your do your work. Uh, but yeah, so 
this is a big, yeah, this is one of those things I'd say probably a lot of the time you'd probably want to actually use this by default um, just to be safe. But, but yeah, it's, sure. it's those kinds of things that are really handy where you don't have to, you don't have to code that yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we got another question here. Bit plus plus is asking whether or not this is using like under the couple covers. Now we're talking about some of the implementation details. Is this using like the background service class, or does Corvell actually schedule a task on the host OS? Let's see. <laughs> Let's get into some code. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. Where would it be? Would it be this one? Okay, so actually, yeah, let's just go to the schedule. Oh, here. I've I've already given it away. It's right here. I'll I'll zoom in too. That is our answer, yes, and indeed. Okay, so here it is. Uh it's a hosted service. Um so no, it's not an OS related thing. It's it's built in to again, I'm using all those .NET primitives. Um and it's funny, yeah, because when I first was thinking about building this, to do this with .NET Framework, I was, you know, it was like, how how am I even going to do this? Because this didn't really exist. Um, I guess there were other mechanisms, but they were they were not as easy as as uh, the way .NET Core .NET five, six, seven, eight now um, are doing are doing this. So anyways, yeah, it's an iHosted service. Um, oh, it's this, yeah, basically, basically there's a timer if you really want to start digging in. Um, so when I first built this, the timer was running, I forget, might have been every, once every 30 seconds or something like that. Um, and then there was a request, hey, I want to time things per second. I, I want to have, I want to be able to do it. And technically, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. But technically, there is a form of cron expressions that does have the second in it. Right, right. So it was kind of like, ah, oh, you got me. Like, <laughs> like that is a thing. Um, and that doesn't mess with concurrency at all, right? That's no. not a concern. What? <laughs> no. no. Yeah. So yeah, Ooh. that that took a while for me to like be convinced. Like, oh uh, yeah, I, doing this once per second. So it's basically just a timer that runs once per second. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can dig into this and we can have a look. And I think this also answered this question about if it needs Azure subscription or can run on-premise. This is all using like classes that come from .NET Core. There's nothing related to the cloud. It's like yep. uh, you can run um, on your project on-premise. Yeah, and again, that comes back to that originally uh, original philosophy that we were talking about at the beginning. Like, I just have a web app. I don't have. I don't want to tinker around with other infrastructure. I just want to. I just want to kind of out of the box. Let's get running. I just have a .NET app, and that's all I. That's all I have. That's all I want. Um, so that's all you need. If you have a .NET application, it could be a web application. It could be a console application. Um, you bring in the library and you, you start using it. Um, you don't need Azure or anything. Well, speaking, you can use it on Azure. You can use it on-prem. So you, you do have that uh -huh. flexibility. Sorry, speaking, Cam. Speaking of that actual scenario, though, what if what if we do want a data store? So I, I get the impression that everything we're talking about so far is just an in-memory queue, right? Yeah. Um, what if we want to persist to a data store? Is that an option, or or is that something we're going to need to open an issue for as a as a suggested feature? <laughs> there is an issue open already. Um, <laughs> no, so um, so no. Right now, you, you cannot save the jobs to. Well, technically, you could do it. So part of your invocable would actually do that, um, which is why I haven't been so so fast on trying to build that feature out. Um, so if you really want to, but again, it's kind of like, well, I'll just use hang fire for that then if I have to right. do it myself, <clears throat> but that is, yeah, again, that is something I, I do want to, uh, build at some point, for example, uh, yeah. So I kind of started, I kind of started on that trend. So you can see here, there is a package for doing caching and using the, a database for caching. Um, that was kind of like. Okay, here I'm gonna I'm gonna start introducing 
persistence to the plot or to the framework or library, whatever you want to call it. Um, cause it's, there are different you get packages. So I guess call it whatever you want. Um, but yeah, anyways, if you want to do caching, there's a Postgres driver, there's an SQL server driver only for caching. Um, next step is, is for queue queuing essentially is the next big one is, Hey, I want to, I want to queue something and, oh, my app goes down. Or maybe I'll maybe I have another a separate process that's going to to churn through those records. Um, and again, this comes back to that like, oh, I just I have a pull request and here like here's even in my own mind, it's like, yeah, I'll just build that feature. But then it's these things like, well, what if I want my web app that has Coravel uh, is using Coravel? I want that to be the producer. Uh, in terms of like queuing, um, I want that to be able to say, okay, here's a job. I'm going to persist that. But then you have a separate process that's um, going to be consuming those jobs. Um, how, so now there's like this totally new concept of, well, I need an API to, as part of this feature, I need an API to say, well, you're not actually going to be reading those from the queue. You're not going to be churning through those records. You're just going to be the producer that produces or that stores those jobs. Um, and then there's going to be another process that maybe you build. So I need an API to say, you're going to start consuming those messages only. Um, so yeah, that it's like these kinds of design, design decisions come into play when when you start talking about like persistence and, and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's something that would, everybody asks for it. Right. So it's kind of like one of those natural next steps, especially if you're using Coravel and then your app grows to the point where you do need that. Um, I think that's probably out of everything, especially with the, I'd say, you know, how the, this project's been around for a while now. Um, I can see that as a really good argument for wanting to to build that, which kind of supersedes the original philosophy. Um, so yeah. Another one, if it, there's an option to invoke some kind of a callback when job completion and failure. So um, well, and and that viewer actually I actually built onto that cue, uh, that question a little bit mm -hmm. more. Um, he was wondering if. Uh, if you can wrap these invocables in something like poly, so you could implement like a retry policy or, or something like that. Yeah. So I, yeah. So I have somebody, uh, an organization who is using the pro version and what they have done is exactly that they inside their invocables, they're using a, another library. Uh, I forget the name of it. But essentially, it's it's a uh, it's like a distributed lock library, mm -hmm. um, and basically, yeah, it's like it's your invocable code, and there's literally just like an extra line of code that says, "I'm gonna do a distributed lock on this invocable," and then you shove all your code inside that that block, um, and then so now he's running he's running Coravel multiple instances of of Coravel. Um, but all the invocables are behind a distributed lock. So essentially they just silently run if if they don't grab that lock. So yeah, you can do you can do something like that. Um but again, and this comes back down to that's nice that this concept has been decoupled from all the all the different features. Is like now you don't have to worry about whether you're manually queuing that item or it's a scheduled item. Um like especially with, with the pro version. Oh, I don't have it running anymore. And he's um, right. So if you have multiple instances of, of the invocable running, even if they're on different processes, uh, you've got a distributed lock that you've built in there. So yeah, you can do that with circuit breaker, retry patterns, all that stuff, um, kind of all in your hands. You can do whatever you want. Again, that, and that's why if that's why I haven't been so like aggressive in building those features into Coravel, because it's like you you can do it yourself. And there's this really good library called Poly that you can use. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of like that ba balancing oh. <laughs> balancing doing one thing really well versus yeah. doing a bunch of things sort of well. 
Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. And there were also some questions about like, what are the limitations with the free version? Uh, does the free version include dashboards as well? So um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what's the difference there for folks that are interested in trying out. So yeah, basically the, the difference. So the pro version essentially is just the UI. It's just the dashboard. Um, but everything behind the covers is it's using it's basically just hooking into the the open source version of it so every i guess there are other there are other features like uh you can there's there's some things <laughs> that you can uh build that will build like uh reports for you um i guess if you want to go to the docs you can you could check that out. But yeah, essentially the open source version is kind of like the engine. The pro version essentially just builds on top of it and it's like all the nice UI kind of stuff. Um, so like- I mean, yeah, you can't understate how powerful a dashboard could be. I mean, mm -hmm. you while you could make it to your point, it's already made, it already has all of the hooks and you can schedule things from the UI it seems and uh, the stuff that you demonstrated was very compelling. Yeah. Um, so for example, uh, you, it hooks into EF core. Um, I know a lot of people have asked, Hey, can I just, I don't use EF core. Can I use something else? Well, it is what it is for now. Um, but yeah, there's just these ways, you know, again, kind of very, very similar to that. I invocable concept in this case is an eye lens and a lens is basically, uh, a report. I guess it more like a projection. Um, I don't have a screenshot here, but yeah, basically it's this report and um, you can, it's just an easy way to build reports. They get automatically added to the menu list here. Um, and again, it's using EF core. So you just kind of use EF core syntax like that. Um, there's also CRUD, a whole CRUD UI that hooks into EF core. Um, again, there's, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't think I have like a whole class example here, but essentially it's very similar. You, you have an interface and you fill out the interface. Um, and then all the UI pieces are automatically generated for you. Like, um, there is that screenshot there. Yeah. Anyways, there's, it's a CRUD interface. <laughs> it's a CRUD builder. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's those extra pieces to the pro project, but again, those are, that's not really related to task scheduling and stuff like that. It's the extra things that you can do. And it's all hooked into e your EF core database, um, which I guess is, is nice. And so that's why I've actually debated as like, oh, maybe I should add persistence to the pro version because there's already pieces that do that, that hook into EF core, um, like the reporting and stuff. But it's such a big, you know, it is uh, persistence is such a fundamental piece if, if you're doing queuing, for example, mm -hmm. um, that it, yeah, when I get around to it, it will be in the open source project for sure. There was a question earlier on too, I'm not going to pull it up, but it relates to the caching feature. And they were asking specifically about whether or not it can do distributed caching. Uh, I guess technically, yes. Um, so I'll go back to here. So there are database drivers for the cache in particular. Um, so as long as your different applications are, are using the same database, you could. Um, if not, then no. That being said, um, the code to do that yourself is actually just this interface that you would build your own if you really want to. Um, you can come in, I mean, you can come in here and you basically like replicate what's here. Um, so uh, technically it's not there, but you could do it. Uh, I don't think it would be that that difficult. Uh, I know .NET, .NET has built in like I distributed cache uh, packages that you can use which are pretty easy to use. Um, and actually that's what Coravel is, 
is built off of. Uh, I can dig in here. So like Corvell's in-memory cache um, is actually using, where is it? Yeah. So it's actually using the built-in dot, .NET caching stuff. It's basically just an API on top of it, uh, essentially, um, just to make it a little bit easier to use. Um, but yeah, now that I think of it, maybe doing a distributed cache wouldn't be that hard because I, the way I built this is to kind of decouple stuff. So technically, I think I could just replace that here with the I distributed cache. Um, and it would work. So anyways, that, that would be another discussion, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> another, another issue to look at and consider and right. Another. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. I think we covered so many questions today already. We did. There was lots of great <laughs> engagement here. This is awesome. I love it. Yeah. I didn't prepare that much, so I'm glad other people had questions to, to <laughs> ask. <laughs> uh, we do have more questions coming in. Let's see. Uh, is there something special about prevent overlapping when you lock a static object? I know we talked about some of the distributed, you, you mentioned earlier, like distributed uh, locking. And um, we, we talked earlier, you know, even before that, about prevent overlapping. Um, yeah, I'll just go to the docs here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess I'm not totally sure, but specifically what the question is really trying to, to, to get at. Um, I guess internally doing this, um, only one instance of, of only one instance using this key would ever run. Technically, I could do I could have this line of code twice, but then I'd have like the same the same invocable running, but I would give it a different key. Um, and you so could it, use name of there also, right? Like name you, of your some you, invocable. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah, you could do that if you want, um, which is yeah, that's probably the more uh, yeah, the better way to do it, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Um, if you're locking objects inside of your own code, it would work, but that would kind of be up to you. Again, again, I you know, I, there are people who are doing that where they're using a distributed lock inside of their invocables, um, which essentially it kind of replicates this, but in a distributed way. Um, so yeah. It works. I think. I think that's what the question's asking. Okay, he's responding. Yeah, yeah, they're clarifying here. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and so you could have you could not call this, and then you would just have what I've highlighted here. But then inside the code of that invocable, I'll bring it up here. So here would be the code for your invocable. Um, Oh, it's an image. I can't highlight it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, this this code here, uh, the in, inside that invoke method, you would wrap all that code around another call, essentially that would be a distributed lock, for example. Or if you just want to Got use it. a lock, I guess you could do that yourself. That that would work. Um, you're, you know, it's totally doable if if you want to do that. Um, so you could do like an in-memory lock or you could do distribute lock there. Um, yeah. Awesome. So I know that we're running low on time. We've got a minute left, but before that, I do have one real quick question. What about testing? Well, again, the nice thing about these in, uh, decoupling the invocables from all these other features is you can test just your invocables on their own. So you just say, hey, give, here's a new daily, send daily reports email job. I'm going to send a mock mailer in here. I'm going to send a mock user repository in here. And then I'll call my invoke method and do, you know, test however, however you want to do that. Perfect. Um, Love it. Yeah. Cool. All right. I think we're about to the end of our time box here. So, yeah, I, whoever just threw up that banner, thank you. I was about to do that myself. Um, <laughs> I just want to take a moment to talk to our viewers. Viewers, if you um, if you want to be the next James on our stream and you want to come on and share something that you think is cool, right? So, like, 
um, you know, we originally envisioned the stream like what we call the hallway track at a conference, right? If you between those sessions at conferences, you always run into your friends that you haven't seen in forever. And they're like, oh, let me show you this cool thing that I did on my, you know, I've got my laptop here. I'm going to show you this cool thing and or give you the, you know, the the more in-depth background behind my uh, behind my talk or whatever. If, if you are watching this stream on YouTube or Twitch, we are talking to you. If you have something cool that you want to show, and it doesn't have to be like expert level cool, right? If you're like a beginner and you just want to say, here's what I learned this week, that's just as good, right? This is a community stream. We want to put community members up on the stream and um, and uh, just celebrate kind of the cool things about this, this .NET ecosystem that we all, we all uh, love and, and hopefully make a living with. Um, so uh, that URL that's streaming along the bottom of the screen right now, go hit that, go sign up. Um, it will actually, you'll pick your own date. Just assume that we're going to go, you know, uh, un unless you hear from us, assume that's the date you're going to go. And um, and that is what the, the, the process is for getting on this stream. So with that, I want to uh, thank James again for coming on and sharing Coravel. Very, very cool project. Saw a lot of positive feedback in the chat. It seems like a lot of folks are interested in trying this and 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 using it. And certainly I hope that they like it enough that they buy that pro license because open source is cool. It's even cooler when open source developers can make a living at it. Um, so with that, thank you everyone for tuning in. And we want you to check out our other great .NET live TV streams and videos at .NET WAC Live. Uh, tune in next week where hopefully we will have a stream, but we don't have one scheduled yet. Hence, flogging the guests and saying, hey, why don't you come on our stream and talk? If we don't see you next week, we'll see you again soon. And with that, uh, have a good week, everybody. And uh, see you again next time on On.NET Live. Bye, friends. Wow.